Hello, everybody, and welcome to the HTML All The Things podcast, episode number 16, Responsive Design. I'm your host, Matt Lawrence, and I'm joined again by my co-host, Mike Coran. What have you been up to this week, Mike? Yeah, hey, Matt. Uh, so we this week, I've been kind of going through the uh, Hat website and doing all the front-end Vue.js stuff. And what happened was we were going through it, and I realized that there's some features that I would have to kind of remove from the Vue.js side until we have the server side up, which is going to be a Node.js server. Uh, and what we realized was we didn't want to do that. Um, we wanted all the features to be out on launch because that just makes sense. There's no point in like crippling our product right away, right out the gate. There's not the, and then and then you know waiting a month to put those features back in. If we can kind of grind it out and get get both the server side and the front end up at the same time, and then work on deployment, which is a whole other thing that we're gonna have to work on. So uh, Matt and I had a discussion, and we decided to take a couple extra days. So hopefully by the end of this week, I can have a really like solid base, solid working product, and then maybe sometime early next week we could launch it. Uh, but again, stay tuned for that. Hopefully we have some some more to talk about next week on that front. Uh, what about you, Matt? Uh, so yeah, so we were involved in that conversation, uh, or I was involved in that conversation, obviously. And then uh, this week was kind of really, kind of really heavy on on leads. So we've actually had quite a bit of leads come in, quite a bit of uh, requests come in, just for either updates or what have you. And uh, some of the biggest leads I think we've had in a very long time uh, have kind of just kind of like fell into our lap. So we've had we've had like, or I've been handling like a bunch of phone calls and different email threads and that that type of thing. And uh, so at the moment we're just kind of waiting. Uh, you know, kind of waiting on people or, you know, we, we've kind of done everything we can do at this at this stage and see where the leads go. Um, but if we and Mike and I were discussing this before the show, if, if we get to the point where we actually get like actually get all these leads and get them all at once, we're actually going to need to need to like hire somebody or like at least get someone to help us because uh, we are we will not be able to do four or five projects all at once kind of thing. So uh, just kind of a, an interesting, an interesting and very quick development. I guess that's part of running running a business is you need to be super agile and ready just in case, so that if you need to, you know, make that phone call to a friend who knows the the stuff in the same industry, or you know, you need to actually go to you know a job board or something and and ask for help, then you know you're ready to do that because that could really happen in the next month for us. Um, but for right now, we're going to jump into this uh, this episode. Uh, so I'm just going to do a, a brief introduction uh, for the show. I'll go through the segments and then I'll pass it on to Mike for that first segment. So basically, we'll be covering different uh, design or layout methodologies. And there's a few different types uh, that are kind of like, you know, they're quote unquote official names. So they're static, uh, liquid, adaptive, as well as responsive. And we'll be kind of covering, you know, more or less the different or like the different ends of the spectrum. So specifically the static and the responsive ones. Um, however, if you want to read an article uh, regarding all these different the all these different ones, we have one by uh, a guy named uh, and hopefully I'm saying the right, the last name correctly, uh, Nick uh, Pettit. Um, he has a he has a blog post on the uh, Team Treehouse website that's uh, that's really good. So I will be uh, putting a a uh, link to link to that in the show notes, of course. Uh, so going into our segments, we have segment number one, which is going to be what is responsive design. Segment number two is going to be how to implement responsive design. Uh, segment number three is going to be when to use static instead of responsive. And then, of course, our recurring segment web news, which is Mike's this week, and it's early access software slash games. So I'm going to toss it off to Mike for that first segment there. Yeah, Matt, thanks. Uh, so what is responsive design? Uh, I'm sure that when you're starting out in web development, you're kind of thinking like, yeah, you know, get an HTML page going and that's it. You're good to go. But uh, when you quickly, what you quickly realize is there's a million different devices out there. And when you're designing something, especially as a product for a uh, for a customer, you want their the design to look good on almost anything that their customers could possibly use. Uh, so that is where responsive design comes in. So responsive design responds to its environment. In the case of web design, it's something that's specifically referring to how a website user interface responds to different window sizes and technologies available. So this gives us the ability to have a single design, a single design language that changes and adapts to various devices from ultra wide PC displays down to some like, you know, really tiny older smartphone. Obviously you have to kind of limit yourself depending on your resources available, but that's the general you know, the general aspect of it. 
Uh, it also allows users to have make the most of the screen real estate they have. So for instance, having two browsers snap to each other side by side on a 1080p screen. So as soon as you, you know, you, you snap a couple browsers together, the web page will kind of reflow or look a little bit different, but you'll be able to use that real estate, one screen, two web pages. And that, that really helps with, like when your page is really responsive and really good in, in mobile layouts, though it can be also used on a larger layout with a smaller kind of size. So you can have like two or three web pages side by side and uh, still, still have them usable. Uh, so then it will, that leads into like how to technically implement it. So the responsive design makes use of a variety of tactics and they're generally found in CSS. I mean, there's, there are some JS tactics, especially back in the day that you could use, but right now we're going to be focusing on media queries, uh, relative positioning, relative, uh, length units and white space. And that ends, uh, our responsive design segment Our what is responsive design. So I'm going to pass it off to Matt to uh, either continue on or go on to the next segment. Sure. Yeah. So let's kind of jump right into the to segment two there, because I think I think our web news is going to be extra long today, um, as well as these other these other pieces, because this is a this is kind of a more technical a more technical kind of topic. So um, segment two, how to implement responsive design. So I kind of have like a more detailed breakdown of those kind of like those tactics or those methods that that Mike mentioned, uh, and they are uh, they are of course starting with the media queries. So media queries uh, kind of offer or they do offer breakpoints to a design, and they allow developers to apply design changes at specific breakpoints. So for example, at a certain max width, which is probably the most popular breakpoint, you could do other ones like max height or something else as well. Um, so I just have a couple of examples here. So the first example is when a when the screen hits a max width of, let's say, 900 pixels, then you could hide the desktop version of the nav bar and then show the mobile nav bar. So as we've discussed on other other episodes of the of the show, the there are like quite a lot of changes. Like the nav bars, especially if it's a very busy, a very packed site, nav bars are rather intricate in terms of HTML, CSS, and the actual design aspect because there's a lot of buttons there, lots of menu options. Sometimes there's social icons. There's contact information there. You know, sometimes it can open up huge menus. It has to all change. All the buttons have to be there on mobile. All the buttons have to be there throughout the entire thing. So it really does depend uh, on, on you know, like it depends on a lot of, of kind of coming in there. So sometimes you have to have an entirely separate div or an entirely separate nav section that's for mobile. And you literally hide your desktop one and show the, show the, the mobile one when when you need to do that if especially if it's a very busy nav bar and media queries is generally how you would do that rather than use a js method which you know you could use this is sort of the more modern and the method that we use for this um another way though is you know you don't necessarily always just want to have to remove something you don't just want to have to like get rid of it um so what you can do is you can manipulate it. So another example I have listed here is manipulating uh, a class at a certain breakpoint. So you can make it 100% width once the screen hits 900 pixels wide, whereas before it was declared at, let's say, a 50% width. So what I mean by that is, let's say you have content blocks and you have you want it to make you want to make it so that there's you know a maximum of two content blocks beside each other. Really high level example: two content blocks beside each other on a screen on on desktop screens. So you know high definition screens, large monitors, and then they like you know they kind of go down, 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 down to smaller screens. So basically, you'd have like two, you know you you want you want to only have two there. So you'd have one at fifty percent of the width on the left, another one at fifty percent on the right. But once you hit those those uh, cell phone screens, which are also high definition, but they're they're physically smaller. The dimensions are, are much smaller. You want to make sure people can read it, and especially if the person is holding their phone in portrait mode, which they're pro- which they probably are, a 50% width is not a lot of real estate. So you might at that, let's say that 900 pixel max width, or maybe you want to do it at a different one. It's up to you. You can make it so that they're both 100%, and then they push each other out of the way and they wrap so that one, like the left one, goes up top and the right one goes at the bottom. You can obviously manipulate it more than that but that's sort of that's sort of what you know what we're getting at here is you can you know you can manipulate what you have already you can you know hide things show things etc and that that that's for specific breakpoints and you can see that especially if you're using something like bootstrap bootstrap has like specific uh, specific breakpoints, especially for things that you may generate from Bootstrap, like nav bars, which are basically pre-generated. They have like sort of a pre a pre-done like, oh, at this point it'll become a touch a touch interface. At this point, like, and you can call on it. You'd be like, oh, at medium size, I want this to be larger. At the small size, I want this to be you know smaller or whatever you want to do. Um, so that'll move on to the next point here. Then, so then relative positioning. So this is something that I use a lot. Um, 
and it's literally just position relative. The actual CSS property position sets a relative. And what I'll do for responsivity with this is I'll position absolute elements, so position absolute, within a relative container. And then I will control the relative container to automatically move that absolute element within the container. So my, the best thing I can think of in, in the case I probably use this the most is if you want to keep an icon in the top right. So let's say you have a content box and you want to make sure that your share, like so it's just, let's say it's a Facebook icon. You want to have your Facebook icon always in that top right corner. Well, because your screen, your screen like dimensions are changing, your window dimensions are changing. You, you want to, you know, ensure that that button or that Facebook button stays in that top right corner. So what you would do is you'd have an, a relative content box and then you would absolutely position your Facebook icon, let's say 10 from the top and 10 from the right. So now it stays there, right? 10 away from the top border, 10 away from the, the, the right, the right border. And then it just, it, it just sits there no matter what the script, the content block could be that 50% block that we mentioned before. It could be 100%, 20%. You can move it around and it'll be attached to that box, but it will always be in that top right corner. So it's kind of like, it's, it's, it's kind of like the, the best way, in my opinion, in, in the best way to keep something locked down where you're like, I want the user to always look in the top right corner for a share menu to share it to Facebook in this case. And so that's, that's just how I kind of lock it down. And, but at the same time, I don't have to keep manipulating that Facebook every, every time the screen shifts, I don't have to go, Oh, you know, let, let's position it 10 more to the left. Now, 10 more to the left, 10 more to the left. You don't have to do that. Relative positioning is how we absolutely do this. Another way to do this, and this applies to a bunch of properties, is relative length units. So units allow your elements to be responsive. These are these units are dynamic and they change based on their environment. So unlike absolute length units, which is what you're probably thinking of, which would be something like centimeters or millimeters or pixel or or pixels px, and there's a few others. You know, those are absolutes. It's like, you know, this is going to be two centimeters. This is going to be a couple of millimeters. This is going to be 18 pixels, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Relative length units have, have a variety of types and they are, they are dynamic in that they are usually in relation to something else. So I'm just going to go through three examples. So REMs are relative to the font size of the root element. So that, there you go right there, right? It'll change dynamically as your page changes and it'll it'll move it around. Uh, percentage, percentage, same thing. So it kind of goes back to that content box example that I gave before. 50% width versus 100% width. You're using the 100%. It's 100%, you know, generally of your viewport, depending on how you have it wrapped and all that. But for this, for the, the for the case of this example, it'll be 100% of that whole of that whole viewport of the whole window there. Um, and then there's also VW, which is viewport widths. And those, that's relative to 1% of the width of the viewport. So you can, you can set things up so that they change as the viewport changes, it changes its width. You can have things, you know, grow or whatever. Like you have it set to a certain size in relation to the viewport. And the viewport, of course, is dynamic as people drag it, as it appears on different screens, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I did get these definitions and these three examples, and there are more of them uh, from W3 Schools. And I will include that link in the show notes so you guys can go and check out the full list of uh, not, not only the relative length units, but also the absolute length units as well. Uh, and another thing is white space. So if you're thinking white space, you're like, well, you don't like necessarily generate white space. So, you know, you might with, you know, pushing things out of the way or whatever, but white space is generally nothing. So it's the space, it's the space between elements. For example, the space between columns, let's say if you have a multi-column, multi-column article. Basically, it's the blank space on a web page. And responsive design uses this as a buffer zone to move elements around various elements. So one of the things, one of the things you'll notice, especially on nav bars, or right now I'm looking at I'm looking at a Google Docs document. We have all the sort of like the meta and the word processing icons and, and options on the top left. Then there's a massive amount of space with nothing. And then on the right hand side, I have, you know, the share menu, the who's in this, who's in this article, you know, there's my, my little Google, uh, Google avatar thing sitting right there to tell me that I'm logged in, but there's that huge amount of white space. And what that's for is so that when I start right now, I'm on a 1080p screen. So if I were to start shrinking this window down, maybe using that snap feature, like we mentioned, maybe if I want to snap it or just move it, or if I want to use this on a phone, um, you know, that way it has that room so that those elements are not right up against each other. They don't have to start stacking immediately. They have room to kind of go in and out and move around. So white space is quite vital when you're talking about responsive design. Now, 
when I say white space, though, you know, it's blank. So people might think at first, like, oh, man, you, you know, this is rather, this is rather limiting. Like, we don't want to use, we don't want to use this white, like, we, we want to use this white space. We don't want to leave it as white space. But if you fill it up too much, it, you know, you, you're going to require a place or a space to, to move those elements around. Those elements, if you have, if, if, so I'll use the Google Doc example again. If there were elements all the way across this and there was no, no, you know, white space in between these two, these two sections, like I said, the left and the right, we would literally have to displace all those elements in some way every single time the screen shrunk down from this size. They'd have to go somewhere. They'd have to stack on top of each other. They'd have to paginate, hide in different menus. It would be a real serious mess and a real problem for for developers I because it's it's you have to constantly be be shrinking it and it's going to become really too crowded especially on smaller screens if you're trying to use up all of the all the white space it's it's very difficult for users to you know kind of stay focused on one thing and it's very difficult for for people to read and, that, and that's kind of why we're starting to see at least in my opinion sort of a minimalist design you know trend more or less where you know, there's, it's starting to come out where if you want to have like a list of your blog posts, it's a real nice big tile, real nice big content block with a nice, you know, title. Maybe it's right in the center, right at the bottom. But there's not a lot of stuff all over the place. We're not, we're not, we're not listing it like a spreadsheet. It's not really crowded. It's a very minimalist area that uses the white space to sort of bring a little bit of elegance and a little bit of style and a lot of usability for the developer when they're trying to make something responsive. It really kind of opens it up for the minimalist, but then also really helps on the technical side. So you're not constantly displacing things or overwhelming the user in terms of the UX side of things. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to pass it off. There's another point here and I'm going to pass it off to Mike for the next part of this segment's discussion. Yeah, thanks, Matt. And I, I think you covered uh, those topics really well. The one one thing I just wanted to add, um, and I, I just thought of it while you were talking, we, we actually had an episode on Box, Flexbox, and Grid before, where we talked a little bit about responsive design. And I just want to add that uh, there is another there is another way to do responsive design, and that's with Flexbox or Grid. Um, it's good that you covered those those other ways, Matt, though, because Flexbox and Grid are still not supported on all the browsers. I mean, they're supported on all current browsers, but if you want to be programming something for like backwards compatible, i.e., stuff like that, the ways that you're that you're talking about it is a much much better way to do it. Whereas if you want to go to the Flexbox and Grid way, uh, it, they're great ways and they're very very powerful and they're really really uh, really really kind of easier to use, um, but um, it's definitely it, it's definitely like you, you need to take into account that if your customers are going to be using older browsers, uh, you need to you know kind of work around that somehow. Uh, I just want to mention just quickly on Flex, Flexbox, you know, there's the the really easy way of like just flex direction. So you have you know some some boxes placed in a row. You need you need to switch to a column. You can literally just use a flex direction uh, element on the on the CSS element and switch it to row or column as as the uh, media queries happen so that that's really that's really good uh, you can use the flex grow property so that that will dictate on how how much space take is taken up while the object is actually growing while while, while the uh, screen is expanding uh, that's a really good property uh, and in grid like like i said in that other episode it's, it goes into a little more detail on how grid works but with grid you can kind of actually lay out a very like uh an actual grid and place stuff based on your media query. So, which is, which, if you think about it, it's pretty powerful because you can literally have an element go from, you know, top right corner to middle to middle of the screen, which you can't really do without creating a separate element for that and then hiding and showing it without, it, only grid kind of allows you to do that, uh, which is why it's great for responsive design. Unfortunately, if you want to, you know, worry about the older browsers, you're going to have to somehow build in a, a fail safe. And uh, that, that kind of takes me to my next point. And the point that I wanted to talk about was uh, what do you design for? Like, do you design for mobile first and then go from mobile to large? Or do you design for large screen first and then go from large to mobile? Um, and what, what I've been reading and what I've been noticing lately is that it seems that it's more popular now to design for mobile and go to large. I'm guessing with the, uh, with the more uh, popular applications, with the more like uh, current applications, the ones that are being used by the mass public, a lot of that is being used mobile first. And the, the major amounts of numbers or like a, at least a big portion of numbers is coming from a mobile device. So if you think about it, putting more effort into actually getting a mobile 
uh, version of the site is is more important than you know thinking like big and then going back to small because you're always going to have to compromise a little bit if whichever way you're doing it uh, unless unless you know you have infinite time and infinite money. So uh, that so this is useful when you're designing for older browsers. So what, what you can do what you can do is you can use an at support as well. Uh, a lot of people will will go mobile to large and they'll design mobile for even the older browsers. So let's say IE doesn't support Flexbox or Grid and you really want to use those two. You can use an at support tag in your CSS and see if it supports Grid or Flexbox. Uh, and if it does, then, you know, let it use the, the more advanced design. But if it doesn't, worst case scenario, they see a mobile ready design. And yes, it's a one column design and it doesn't look as great on a larger screen. But you're kind of you, you kind of know that 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 percentage of the public is going to be very small. And I don't think they're going to mind too much seeing a functioning site and a, and a visually decent site. Uh, maybe not the most advanced site ever because they're they're using IE. You can kind of assume that there's not. They're, they're not caring about the aesthetics of a website as much as the functionality. Um, and I'm hope I prove me wrong. Like if anyone has any other experience with people using IE and like saying that they don't like the look of the site, let me know. Uh, but th that's how I see it. So I think, I think it's okay to, to definitely do that. Maybe with, with a newer application, if you, if your demographic is going, to, you know, is going to be maybe the younger audience, the audience that uses the mo mobile way more than the computer, uh, way more than a larger screen, then maybe it is a, a, a very good idea to start with a mobile site and then design for the other sites with media queries. So design for the other sizes with the media queries. Uh, but traditionally, and how we learned to design when we first did it, we designed for larger screen and then kind of brought it down to mobile. Uh, and I, th I think that's still viable depending on the audience, like I said. So uh, a lot of the smaller business websites that we design are meant for like an older audience. And uh, as we've looked at our analytics, we see that they're still using computers. They're still using larger screens. So we know that those decisions were like the decisions that we make are usually justified uh, because it's not like we make a bad mobile design. It's just we we make it so that all the functionalities on the larger screens and then it kind of takes away maybe not functionality but because of the, the limited the limited view size we kind of hide the functionality away in different menus and uh, we hide some of the, the the features that won't work too well on a phone and stuff like that um, so that's kind of my take on how like w which to design first and I, I think it really depends on the audience that you're designing for I think it's good that we can design both ways now and it's definitely worthwhile to take a look before you jump into a project uh, but now, unless Matt has anything to add to that, I'll let him take over segment three. Yeah, so I did have one one thing to add, and it's it's mm -hmm. it's regarding that last point because we had we had discussed that very very briefly uh, before the show, and that and that's the you know do you design for the desktop and then you know make it responsive for mobile or do you design mobile first and 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 like so I mean I think you mentioned it in terms of the small business sites you know we definitely we definitely do you know have we do do the uh, the desktop site first, and then we kind of work it down into the mobile site. And what that what that does, and this will work both ways. But what that does is, whatever you and, and and this is like a personal opinion on mentality is when you're when you're putting something together, let's say for the desktop in our case, what you're trying to do is just figure out how to make that design work on mobile. And it's not like e even if even though like even if you like try and try and try and try and try, your mentality is still that oh, I need to make this desktop site work on mobile. And you're not designing mobile first. It's just sort of my opinion. And so it, like Mike is very right in saying that depending on what you will be doing, so like some people will be most definitely working on things that are essentially going to be an app just in the web. So like a web app, uh, but like people on their phones are going to be using it. Um, one of those things is like, yes, like if they design mobile, then there's going to be just inherently, in my opinion, a lesser, a lesser opinion i guess of the larger screen you know so it, it it like there is a difference just in terms of in my opinion mentality whereas you know we have a lot of older folk that are going on to these websites or people like that are maybe at work and just using actual desktops so that's why we put that in but you know when it comes to you know making that desktop nav bar work for example you know, you're just trying to cram everything in and make sure it works. You're not thinking like, like, not like you are thinking, but not as strongly as like, oh man, maybe we should make these buttons different. Let's make sure the UX is, is whatever. Cause I, the way I see it is what you started with is even just, even if it's just a little bit, it's still going to be your kind of like your focus of the project. Cause that's like sort of its foundation. So 
that's a really that's a really good point and and something that you know we we will absolutely do if somebody wants it on mobile first then we'll design it for mobile first and then just make it bigger but then at that point the desktop is going to have less consideration i guess you know what i mean just just inherently almost subconsciously at that point um so i think i'll move on to segment number three here which is when to use static instead of responsive design so static layouts um or static design is is when the page is laid out in, in a fixed way so the elements on the page do not adjust to the screen resolution or the window changing size uh generally overflow is used to scroll around uh when the page when the page is you know too large or too wide for uh to for a screen if a screen is is too small um older sites especially those that appear you know sort of left aligned and not full screen are done in a static layout due to their age they're typically done with the width of like 640 or maybe 800 pixels or something something along those lines and they remain left aligned because back then most of the screens were like 640 by 480 or you know maybe 800 by 600 so they kind of like where they where they were designed for those types of screens um and those websites generally or they do not if they're static they do not sh uh, shrink beyond that size so if you're on a you know if you're on a cell phone and you you, you may have to really really zoom in uh it, like the, the experience isn't really good because it's this fixed fixed non-modern experience basically and generally because of this elements are not optimized for all platforms which may result in extremely small buttons for people that are trying to click something on a smartphone which obviously using your thumb which isn't super precise um and obviously like text on high definition uh, on high definition screens uh, may may appear very very small and generally you try to like blow things up on us on a smartphone a little bit uh, to make sure it's nice and visible and that you know generally will not be happening in these static layouts so and and like i said these are generally static layouts are older however so this is why this segment even exists is however we do have a few instances in which you should do a modern or what we are calling a modern static design or a modern static layout and that is that we have personally experienced situations in which a single device or a type of monitor will be using will be used throughout the entire time so adding responsivity in any way would just simply add more development time more testing time and then will cost the customer more money just by default so with a single screen in mind, you can, you know, in addition to not having to add stuff, you can also, you know, you can use that space at your disposal. You could, you could, you know, take advantage of unique characteristics of the screen, like a notch. You can, you know, fill up more white space because you're not so worried about things having to move so much. You could fill it in within reason to make, you know, still have some white space so people can read everything, but you could really use up that screen. It's sort of like the whole argument of like Apple, for example, makes the iPhone. They also make iOS, so they work really well together. This is sort of you making your web page your your user interface so that it works on this screen but if it goes to another screen it's not going to be as good because you designed it for this screen so that's the whole thing um so with this screen with this screen in mind um like i said you can use you can fill fill any any available white space you can do anything with the notch but this type of this type of ideology applies to older technology as well so in, in my personal experience, I, I were, used to work in a plant, and we've seen industrial equipment, um, they use what's called PLCs. So P, I'm not going to get into all of this like, like super in-depth, I'm just going to glaze over this, but PLCs are basically, they control large equipment, and generally an HMI, which is called a human machine interface, or just basically just a GUI, a user interface, is required to control it via a touch screen generally. And what what's happening is, is like that, like, in, in industry, they it's very utilitarian. They don't really update all that often. They don't really care. And so they just have this one user interface on this one screen that might be, let's say, 800 by 600. And so they design it with a special software that's for HMIs. But the web is very, very, very rapidly expanding. So in our opinion, it's it's not outrageous to assume that one day a browser version, and maybe it's already happening, I don't exactly look this stuff up for industry stuff, but may, you know, it's not outrageous that a browser version of an HD, of, a, of an HMI, that user interface, that human machine interface, um, you know, it's not outrageous that a browser could take off, take over that job. And so and so we've had we've had situations where 
like I said, with the one screen, and this could also apply to you. Maybe you're going to score a job in like a plant or in, in some sort of in some sort of engineering scenario where the customer is an industrial client and they want something like an HMI set up so you can control something on that screen. And though and, and the thing is with, with these screens is that it's you, you don't really have to even worry about them updating it next year, two years, three years, five years. They don't really need to worry about it. In industry, like I said, utilitarian, they they buy it, and if it works, they keep it, and they'll continue using it until enough enough of an upgrade happens, and they have enough budget to then upgrade the machinery they have, and that could be years or even decades. So you can really take advantage of those little screens and make sure that you know people people understand how to use it. They understand where the maybe there's a an electronic e stop on there, e stop button. You know they understand how to use all the buttons, all the other things, and so. You know, in the future, that that could be a serious thing that a lot of web devs may get employed to do as industry starts moving towards a more a more uh, futuristic, I suppose, more futuristic sort of point of view. That may never happen. That is a theory, but it is one of those use cases where a fixed screen, especially for people that develop HMIs with the proprietary software, fixed screens are definitely still used in those cases. Um, so when we first got when we first got into business, um, we set out with the idea that we would never make a static layout. Um, all of our all of our websites were going to be mobile friendly or responsive, and like make sure that like we we because back at the back in the day when we first started, everyone was sort of on the fence. There was a lot of websites that were in production that were still the the kind of like the two the two website. Uh, the two website kind of layout, if you will. So it was, you know, here's your desktop site and then M dot whatever website it is dot com would be, you know, your mobile site. And there was still a lot of that going on. And a lot of people would still assume that they had to pay for, oh, I want you to do my desktop site and I want you to do my mobile site. So even as soon as, you know, maybe three, four, five years ago, that that uh, conversation was still happening a decent amount, but things have sort of started moving toward uh, responsive design. And that's when we really started hunkering down into responsive design. Now, the reason why, the reason why I even mentioned this is because, you know, as a business, you have to be, you have to be dynamic and you have to really be able to adapt really quickly. And so you may get hired for one of those static, static jobs where one screen, one device, one whatever, one resolution is going to be used at all times. And you have to be like, okay, I got to change my mentality. Why would I make it responsive when I don't have to? And then the customer is going to end up saving some money. You're probably going to end up saving some time and you're going to get a better product out of it. Um, however, I will say that we wouldn't recommend making something with a static layout unless it has those characteristics specific very, very specific set of parameters that need to be met, like the, like I said, the screen, the dimensions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In general, we would recommend making something responsive because it's future proof and it works on, you know, virtually any screen size as well. Um, I think unless Mike has any other comment, I think that's, I think we'll move right on to the web news segment for this week. Yeah, uh, actually I do have a couple comments there, Matt. Uh, so I've actually done a quite a bit more uh, static design than I thought I would. And like we designed an application for iPads, uh, specifically the 10 inch iPad Pro. And they were deployed across, you know, hundreds and hundreds of stores uh, and only on those devices. And it really helped to know that it was going to be on that one device, both for the design process, which was done by a third party. And for myself, when I was actually coding it and w w was doing the layout, knowing that it was only going to be on one of those devices and that was a stipulation in the contract and all that and so far it's proved true uh was a big help in accelerating the process and a big help in also you really utilizing that space like you said like if you know it's going to be on that screen you know exactly how you're going to make it and it's going to look really really sharp on that one screen and that's great and you can put a lot of effort into that um and that's not necessarily a bad thing again it's it, it those kinds of things don't happen too often but don't don't be afraid to say okay I'm gonna forego responsive design this time uh, and do static. The the thing that I would like to say is if it's a web application though, uh, sometimes the client will still want to see it and view it in a browser. So when you do it and when you stip when you say that it's going to only look good on an iPad, make sure it's at least functional in a browser and not looking like a janky mess, not looking like it's crazy like you know 
convoluted. You don't have to put too much time into it, but make sure that they can at least use the web application uh, and test out the features in a browser. Otherwise, you're going to have clients reporting random features that aren't working when uh, it's just the fact that they're not using it on the actual device that they wanted it. They wanted to use it on. Um, so yeah, just just, just a little mar remark there for that. Uh, uh, other than that, I think, yeah, we covered it really well, and it's, it's a good little good little segment, and let's move on to web news. So this web news, uh, actually suggested by one of our Patreons, uh, Grisha, and uh, th thank you for him for mentioning uh, for mentioning this to me and uh, give, giving, him, giving me this idea, and I, definitely something that I've, I've thought about and talked about with a lot of other people before. I don't know why we didn't even think about it for web news yet, but uh, early access software and games. That's the web news. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of people are going to have different opinions and it's going to be kind of like a, a fiery discussion. Matt and I will probably, you know, argue about certain things here and there. But let's uh, that's the whole point of web news. Let's get into it. So I'm going to start with the potential issues um, because I, I err on the side of caution with these things, especially because I've, I've been burned quite a few times. Uh, but really, like what I'm talking about with, with early access, I want to make this clear is like, it's it's also a beta encompasses betas, uh, especially paid betas. So if you ever want, if you have to have to pay for a product, and uh, and it's still not released, it's not a 1.0 version. This is what I'm talking about. This is the kind of things I'm talking about. So uh, potential issues: developers don't want the pressure of saying that it's version 1.0 because of the assumed amount of, amount of polish. So they'll just always release a 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 uh, right to the public. Uh, because if they and and whenever someone reports a bug, they'll say, "Oh well, it's still in beta, it's still in alpha. Uh, don't worry about it. That bug will be fixed." And then no one, no one really complains because they know oh, it's in beta, it's in alpha. I'm using it in beta and alpha. Uh, but as soon as they put a 1.1 or a 1.0, uh, then people will complain and say that it's a bug and it should be fixed right away, and that I, I'm paying for this and it's not fixed and I want my money back. Uh, I, 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 the developers have told have discussed this before and that is literally a, one of the reasons that they decide to do it this way um it's it's a potential issue because it, it's a cop-out in my opinion a lot of because a lot of the time they'll never really get to the point of 1.0 or at least in their minds they're never at that point they'll never release it so what what what's happening here is that you're always going to be in a beta state of software where the developer is always thinking oh it doesn't have to be polished not a great state of mind to be in uh, so the next thing is, is the developer getting paid and receiving uh, free bug testing while in early access and beta. It doesn't seem fair to the users or customers that is buying it. So usually back, I guess back in the day, I don't know how long ago this would be, maybe five, ten years ago, uh, people would have to, you know, develop software, then pay a bunch of people to use the software and then report bugs in a, in a bug reporting software and then fix the bugs, then release the software as a 1.0 version. Nowadays... I don't know if that happens at all anymore. Really, people will just code the software, do some minimal bug testing with like one or two people or however many, like depending on the size of the software, obviously, do minimal amounts of, of bug testing for at least the major features and then release it. And then what what they'll do is they'll get all the, all the different devices using it. They'll get all the different people using it and they'll pour in the bugs and then they'll fix the bugs as they come in. Now, yes, the I guess that's a good way to do it if you're a developer, but as a customer, when you're paying for something, especially if it, if it's a, you know, an early access, even though it's labeled as early access, the customer still, you know, he's paid real money for it. He's invested real time into it. It's kind of, it feels kind of weird to have to then, you know, be the bug tester for the, for the person and, and report the bugs into this, like, you know, intricate system, whatever they use uh, and have them fixed and stuff like that. So just a weird little thing. Uh, so the other another potential issue is the the potential that you could pay for something and it never gets fully released. So I already talked about that a little bit in the first uh, point, but uh, you could you know you could pay for a game, you could pay for a piece of software, and it could be two, three, four, or five years until it's released, or it could be never released. So you don't know what you're getting. You're not like they could say that they're guaranteeing you a release, but they themselves could you know run into some hard times and never release it so you could you could end up with a buggy uncom not complete on like not none of the promises fulfilled piece of software that you've paid for and now you really can't get your money back so be, I'm, I'm always wary of that kind of stuff um i'm one of those people that doesn't really do the whole kickstarter thing i i know the the benefits of it and i know all that but like i always like to you know wait for something to come out and then use it use it fully there's obviously some exceptions to that, and I'm sure Matt and I will talk about that once I once I wrap this up a little bit. So, and then 
the next, the next, next and last point for the potential issues that I have is even if something is free, but in beta, like uh, a programming example would be Flutter.io, which is a cross cross platform framework for uh, for Android and iOS development uh, developed by Google. It could be abandoned, so you could put a bunch of efforts into something that's in beta and free, uh, and it you could you know learn it, be the, be an expert in it, and then all of a sudden Google would be like, well, you know, I, I woke up this morning and decided it's not worth putting any more effort and money into it. Let's move on to something else. And all that effort that you just put in is gone because, and they really, they released a beta. They didn't say it was fully released. So they there's nothing that they can fall back on. They've done this with fully released products. So, I mean, a beta is even easier to, to dump, even for a large company like Google. So I don't know, I'm always wary with it. Um, but I could also see some potential benefits and I'll quickly run through these. Uh, so the user can feel part as part of the development process and the evolving process of the software. When and if it is released, they will be more attached to the product. That's true. Like if you're if you're going through the product and going through it as it's being released, even if it takes a few years and then all of a sudden it's released and you've contributed to the bug reporting, you've contributed to the development maybe in some way, you'll you'll want to use that product for years to come because you you feel like you're part of that product. I could see that being as a benefit. Uh, maybe the developer, he's a really talented guy. He's strapped for stra just strapped for cash, strapped for time. But now he has a chance to maybe release a minimal, minimal viable product that he's made maybe in a couple of weeks or a month or so, and get some feedback and some funding from that product. So in an early access state, I see that as being very idealistic. Um, if a, you have to really believe in the developer and you have to maybe have uh, has a history of being really good. But if he is that, like, you know, that unicorn developer that's really talented and willing to willing to put in his time and make a product that you really want to use, I don't see a problem in, you know, investing in that and uh, having him, you know, develop that product into something further, something better, uh, being in an early access state. Um, that could be an advantage. So another thing is there's a longer update cycle. And what I mean by that is uh, instead of releasing 1.0 and then forgetting about it, usually they'll release, you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. So the more things will get added potentially. Uh, the, the the development cycle, the update cycle will be longer, so you'll be more invested. You'll you'll be you'll you'll stay through it for longer. In a in a game, more updates mean that you'll be coming back. You'll be putting more hours until you get more for your money. Uh, and same thing with with an application. You know, like if, if it's a if it's an IDE, for example. And you keep investing your time and learning it and more features get added to it you're getting more for your time um so i i, I see that as being a positive and then the last thing is uh a user feedback can lead to new features that you want to see and and improvements when when a system's not yet complete so when something's released in 1.0 it's usually harder to add something because it's very solidified it's very minified it's very uh it's very solid so you don't want to add something to break it but when it's when it's being built it's usually not in that state it's very you know the, the flow is going and you people if enough people say something maybe the, the developer can add it right as the development cycle is going uh i see that as pretty I, i've seen that a few times and I've, I've enjoyed that kind of addition um so that's definitely a positive so other than that uh, those are my like quick little positives and negatives matt what's your take well I, I think i think one of the things that is one of the things that i guess has come from like early access coming out and and when I say early access, my most experience with early access is probably via Steam, so the game client. And one of the things with early access is it's sort of bred like different types of early access, where, you know, early access in in its main, you know, sort of very high level ideals is that a developer releases something that people could play. It has a roadmap to a version 1.0, and then the, the developer slowly works until 1.0. Maybe there's a feedback, like, you know, there's feedback throughout the game. So maybe some tweaks are made, you know, outside of the realm of, of the roadmap. It hits 1.0. The game comes out. It's now considered a quote unquote complete game. And then as modern standards suggest, whether DLC is sold, whether it's a, whether it's a subscription game of some sort, you know, microtransactions, whatever, or just through free updates, the game will live on generally or it could stop at that 1.0 kind of thing, right? Um, but what we're seeing is, you know, that does happen, but it doesn't happen all the time. And we see games that are stuck in what's even an alpha. Like, for example, the game Seven Days to Die is stuck at an alpha stage. And we played that in college. And we played that quite a bit in college. 
So it was far enough where, yes, it was unpolished, but there was enough features that we were able to stay engaged. And we've played it after college for with, with a bunch of friends. And there's like this huge update that's planned for it that I don't know whether it's been delayed or whether it's just so big. I didn't really look it up myself, but I know that there's we have a few friends that are waiting on it because they're a real big fan of the game. But there comes a point in which I think they need to go back to what I would call that base ideology. Like, I don't know whether Steam has ever, you know, said what I just said with the roadmap. But to me, just as, you know, thinking about releasing a product, I would say we need to have a path to 1.0. What, what's happening is these devs are, sometimes they're losing focus, they're, they're missing deadlines, sometimes they disappear, sometimes they just don't talk to people as much, sometimes they miss misquote, sometimes they misquote their, uh, the amount of time it's going to take, which is, you know, that happens. Uh, you know, stuff like stuff like this always happens. But one of the issues is that there's no consumer protection. Well, I mean, there might be some with it with Steam. I don't want to say there's none, but you are kind of jumping in at this early access stage, right? You're jumping in at this special stage. It's not like you're jumping into a product when it was when it's like, you know, fully in production and you know, it's already done and everything's version 1.0 and you're just going at it and you can get perfect support for it and everything else, you know, in an ideal situation. You're jumping in at this, I you know, like I think you mentioned Kickstarter, kind of at like a Kickstarter phase, right? You're jumping in at, at that point where there's something to do there, but it's just not, it's just still, it's just not getting done. And, and I think that, I think personally a 70s to die, uh, like it has a problem with this because they they're, like they're starting to add RPG elements. They're starting to add all this other stuff. And I don't know whether our the audience for this podcast are aware of my many video game things. But what they're basically doing is changing a lot of the game's internal systems, probably based on feedback. But there's a comes a point where it's like we were playing this game in college. That game should be you take those rough features, you publish them up, maybe tweak tweak some of them, not change or like evolution revolutionize or none of that. You tweak. You tweak it and then you release it. And then if you want to support it into the future via DLC, free updates, games as a service like stuff with microtransactions or whatever you want to do, you want to do that, go for it. But I don't agree with this dragged on. Can you imagine Seven Days to Die being in an alpha? It's not a beta. It's an alpha. It still is. It's still an alpha. What are you guys doing? And yeah, it, and, I... and, and everything is still unpolished. Yeah, I agree. I mean, like... Uh... As much as I like the fact that they're adding things, but I I really think that it's a detriment almost to, like, it's a detriment to the main components of the game, you know what I mean? Like, we really like that co- that core components of the game, and at, as soon as you start, like, going on a seven, eight-year binge of alpha, uh, you start to change that those core components enough that now you have, like, maybe you're trying to reach a different audience, maybe that's your goal, right? Maybe the audience that you reached initially wasn't big enough, so you're trying to dumb it down, you're trying to maybe get it to a, a different level, uh, but you're you're kind of angering those people that supported you initially, so that it, it, it makes it, it's a weird thing. Um, again, with Seven Days to Die, I'm not really sure because I haven't, pl- I haven't been following the full, uh, infrastructure but i know that it's happened many times with other games and other applications and other software where like the core audience initially picks it up and then you know they they like the features they use it and then like three or four years down the line it's still an alpha there's still features being added there's features being reworked that people the features that people have used are being reworked and now it's a totally different application and now the people that invested in you early the ones that you should be the most thankful for are getting the the short end of the stick so uh it's it's a i could see it being a really tough line or really like right line to follow because you want to get that larger audience and you want to keep developing your game um and some people i'm sure like uh, our friends uh are really positive on this feat like they really like the fact that seven days to die is being developed constantly um so they they probably take the counterpoint in this argument where they'd say like we well, keep going like who cares about the alpha be 10 20 year alpha just keep developing the features and i'll keep playing it right but i i agree with you in the saying that like it just feels to me that it's just it, it's almost a cop out they don't want to like why alpha why not go to a beta at least by uh, at this point um because i feel like they they want to have that little a little less scrutiny when like a, a, a bug is figured out well, well listen there's a bug it's still an alpha you can't really complain too much you could report it but really like you you got to know what you're getting into you're getting into an alpha that's been out for eight years 
it it is it is an excuse too to an extent. Like yeah. I'm not, I don't want to speak for the developers, but like to me, it it is an excuse for for not wanting to polish things. Like it it it's sort of like it's sort of like a for, for like to bring it back to us, we we have the the skeleton. Like I made the skeleton for our website for htmlallthethings.com. It's not up yet, but you're working with it to add the dynamic stuff. And what we reason why we pushed it back is because we wanted to release it with lesser features and we said no we have to push that back but we still have a road to version one we still have a road to release it and we have ideas for future iterations of the site but what these people are doing is they're hanging on to this like this this mvp and mvps can change i understand that and maybe their vision was too even in the beginning maybe they still they're still going to version one but their vision was way too big right fair enough but there comes a point in which, like, for this, for the website, like I said, like, we've adjusted it by a week or two for good freaking reason. Because the actual base functionality was going to suffer severely. We're new to view, we're new to all of this, so it's going to happen, right? But in the in the same breath, it's like, these guys, like, like a, a, a prime example is a Seven Days to Die, um, they had to update engines. Planet Explorers, they had to update engine. It's like, you guys are waiting so long. That your that your engine is becoming out of date. Like, what are you guys doing? Like, release it. Well, I Get mean, they're rele- they're releasing it quickly on an on optimized engine, on optimized engine. That that to me is a big a big question mark and a big exclamation point. Like, don't do that. If if you're if you know when you're going into it that you're releasing on an unoptimized engine, just delay the release of it. Like, I understand you need money. I understand that like you need that money to keep developing it and I, I get it but like i just i don't see that as being a valid excuse for releasing a game that you're gonna have to rewrite the whole engine for um i mean a, a perfect example counterpoint to this would be mountain blade uh let like let me know if anyone's played mountain blade uh warband or mountain blade the regular one and is waiting for bannerlord like i am but like that game had has been announced for about five or six years now and they keep saying next year, next year, next year. They haven't released it, but that's because they had to rewrite the engine. Like they were going to release it, maybe an alpha or beta, with an unoptimized engine, and they decided, no, 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 let's hold back. Let's rewrite the engine the the right way this time. Let's not release it. Let's do everything the right way. And yeah, it's going to delay, but at least we're going to have a final finished product. Now it's been a long time now, and uh, people are starting to worry. But really, I think that's the right way to go. There's a lot of content out there. If you have the money, if you have the, you know, the time, take the time and do and, and use it to build a better product that when you release will be, you know, at least something that's a good base. My worry is that these games like or, or these applications are releasing with terrible bases. Isn't the whole point of an MVP to release with a really good base that you can build on? And the, the alpha and beta is to re- like work out the bugs of that base and then maybe add a couple features and then, you know, release 1.0 on the same base, not rewrite the whole application from scratch pretty much. Like it, it doesn't make sense to me. I, I agree with you there because there's there's something like Adobe XD is a good example, I think, where they, they had like sort of an early access program in which they, you know, took feedback and that type of thing. And it wasn't even on Windows. And within the, within if I remember incorrectly and, and like I, I it's been a while, so don't quote me on some of this, but um, basically it's like they, they had this they had this this beta window. And it included, you know, just a, just a Mac version in the beginning. And then eventually it added a Windows version and then they released it. And as far as I know now, it is out, uh, like I do use it, I'm just not sure what the versioning is, but it is out in its full capacity, but they're still updating it and adding features. They had an MVP, they had a, they had a road to version one. Now that, now that product is out. People are still going to talk about you when your product gets updated. Even if you are using Unity or some other engine and you need to update it, and maybe that update takes you a year, that's, that's more okay when your product is released. It's not really okay when when we're talking about oh I'm super late like super late at releasing a a like pre-finished product. The biggest game in the world as right now at my last check is Fortnite. That game is in early access. Yeah, I don't like that. It is early Fortnite is in early access. Yeah. What are is. you guys what are you guys doing? And it's not and there's no plan to release it. I think there was some. I think there was some word of next year or something. I again, again I didn't look. Like, I, I, I think I saw it on Twitter. To me that so. it's word. It's a. It's a pretty like the thing is that it's a pretty polished game, and I'm pretty sure they're using the early access as an excuse for any bug. 
Well, the thing the thing with it is, and and I've had I've had discussions with people that I play Fortnite with, and what I think it is is they're trying to get. It's not so much like there are bugs and that type of thing, but like generally speaking, you know, it's up a lot. It it feels like a very pub, a very polished game. What I think they're trying to do is they're trying to hit their stride with, let's let's test this game mode. Let's test this thing out. Let's test that thing out. What what mode should we have in the game full time? Should we have a rotating set of game? Like they don't know what game modes they want in all the time. They don't know how all the events should work. Like I think they're working on logistical things, which like fair enough. But at the same time, it's like you guys are epic games. You guys made you know Gears of War. You make you now have the biggest battle royale game in the world, which I believe is still the biggest game in the world. The biggest game in the world, video game. Like come on guys, like just. Just release it and do your events because your 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 audience is not gonna care whether that little beta tag thing goes away, and there's gonna be there's gonna be like a lot of like 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 people people don't care whether that beta tag is there or not is what I'm trying to say. They're toxic when when they do when there's changes that they don't like. They're happy when there's changes that they do like. And so like like maybe maybe that's it. Maybe they just don't care about the beta tag because they know the people are just yeah. gonna do it anyway. But it's like why not? Like what are you what are you guys doing? I'm not I'm just not sure on that. Maybe maybe this game's gonna re- like ch- totally change. Maybe it's because the, uh, save the world, which is the single player part of the game, is going to be uh, free when it goes uh, version one. I think. Yeah. Like save the world is gonna become free eventually. So so. I think maybe like maybe they want to like like merge the two, right? Like, and so you just download Fortnite, and then you don't have to pay for Save the World, and you just have that one launcher or whatever, which I think it already kind of is. But I haven't paid for the single player. But the thing is, is it's like it's like you guys are the biggest in the world. Like, what are you guys doing? <laughs> like, well, like why why are you still in a beta? Like, maybe maybe, and it's because they put themselves in a corner. Now that they're in a beta and they have to release the game, uh, people are going to be expecting something big for a release. And they've kind of like, what are we gonna do? Like we are the game's already polished, the game's already done. Uh, yeah, the modes change here and there, but they're like, you know, they're that's gonna probably continue happening even when we release. What are we gonna do when we say we're releasing the game? That's so a really like, good point. It, yeah, like it, it could be just a thing where they don't know how to change the name without causing any sort of controversy because now they've put themselves in a weird corner where they didn't re- expect to be in. And I'm sure a lot of other people have done that, like. Um, I think it, a lot, a lot of it has to do with the fact that people are like, well, what am I like? The game's already done. Am I just going to say it's released or are people going to want something more? Like, do they have a roadmap? Does I don't think that a Fortnite has a roadmap really for the most part. Like they're just adding features ad hoc here and there. I know they have like a public Trello. I don't know whether it has like a roadmap section or what the things Maybe. they want done. Maybe. Um, I haven't really followed their news, right? I just kind of play the game. Yeah. Um, but I think I know that free to play for the save the world is part of that roadmap for, for release. I know that um, because if you buy the save the world campaign right now, it's, it's like you get like a founder's pack or something along those lines in which, in which like you're like an early supporter essentially. And then the game's going to be supported by like games as a service, like microtransactions and that type of thing moving forward. Um, yeah. But this game is used in esports. Like several thousands of dollars are on the line here. This game must be, must be, uh, must be like flushed out to an extent because it can't be super buggy and you have you be in esports. There's no way, you know, because people would win just due to bugs. People would win due to weird activities. Like it must be polished to an extent where, like, because yeah, like a lot of the bugs that they're finding are like things like they add a bunch of new things. There's a performance problem with it. They add a bunch of new. They add like something. And there's a bunch of problems with it. And so they fix like those little things, but it's like in general, I don't experience bugs every round. I don't even normally experience bugs. I've had a few little things, but like nothing, nothing as jarring as most early access games that would be on steam. And, and like, it's, I think, I think you might be right. Like maybe they're, maybe they're afraid of, of going over the threshold. Mm -hmm. People are making an expectation of it. I'm not really sure on that. I, I will say, I will say that, I think that people in general are afraid to say something is done. And I think that's because that way they know they've failed. If that makes sense. So if your game is still in in progress and it's not selling well, let's say, right? Just some random game, random piece of software, random website, and it's not selling well, you can say, well, it's not done. So like you could say that, whereas like, I mean, Fortnite's probably not going to fail at launch. Like that sounds ridiculous, but like, 
if you are constantly working on a site and people say like, yo, what's your traffic at? And you're like, oh, I only get like 50 hits a month, but I'm not done it. Then it doesn't feel like a failure. But it's like if you release a product and it does not doing well, that product is technically on paper a failure. You know, maybe you don't feel like it is, but like somebody is going to mark that down. Like if somebody was doing an audit on you, for example, an audit of your success, that would be considered a failed product. So I'm wondering whether it's 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 a it's a fear of failure because when you when you define exactly what you are trying to do, you know when you failed, whereas before you wouldn't know when you failed. Yeah, it's that's just... uh, that's weird, man. It's a weird aspect. Like it's weird that it's become so popular now. Like the the whole early a- early access and beta aspect, where we don't we don't even kind of pay attention to it anymore in our in our day to day lives. Like if if something comes out like a piece of software and it's free and a bunch of people are using it, we're just going to use it. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't matter if it's zero point version zero point one or zero point two or one point one or one point two. Uh, we just kind of use it. And I think like our decision making is is not. We're not using that like, oh, it's in beta. Let's not use it. Decision making like we used to, um, we, where we used to like give betas a different classification. And like, at least I did where in my mind, I would be like, well, if it's in beta, I'm probably just going to have it as a side thing where I'm just going to test it out and see if I like it. You know what I mean? But now it's like, oh, this, you know, framework is in 0.1 alpha. Let's try and do a production site on it. It, it seems flawed. And I think like people are profiting on it, obviously, on, on this thing because they can release something that's not complete. And like I said in the in the notes, uh, getting other people to bug test for you while you don't have to pay for that massive department of bug testers sitting there and hammering at your product is a huge benefit, a huge monetary benefit, and a huge like time saving benefit to them. And all they have to say is, "Oh, it's an early access," so just you know, it's it it it, it like. It's a weird, it's a weird place that we're in, and it's only becoming more popular. Like Kickstarter is the same thing, but for real products. Yeah, you know for, fi- I mean? like, for physical products. Typically. For physical product, which, which is crazy to me. Like you're gonna buy a physical product without anyone having their hands on it. You're gonna spend five hundred dollars, four hundred dollars on something that no one's ever touched before. Like that's not even developed yet. Yes, like the promise features are there, but how many times has it been like? Oh, all the features like that that we announced are there, but they're not exactly as as we said they are. Look at look at the Ouya. Yeah. Like the Ouya did not perform as as it as I as I would expect they thought it would. It did not take off. It did not. There were there, I don't think there was an Ouya two, which I think they said they wanted to do. You know, there yeah. it did not. It did not go to plan. People want to feel like they're a part of something, so they do this early access stuff, or like they kick do the Kickstarter. Because they want to feel like they're, you know, they're kind of getting in on the ground floor level. Mm-hmm. They want to be a part of something before it's cool. You know, whatever, whatever it is, you know, people have their reasonings, but it's, it's like, it's like there's a, you know, they're, they want to get in early and that's why they're willing to spend that much money. But so it's too, it's too hard to, to tell whether something's going to be good or take off. Yeah. Especially well, if it's physical. Exactly. And like, the thing is, is that this existed before in the form of stocks. Or in the form in in the form of investment, but you would get something back from that, not just the product. Like people would invest money into a company, whether it be a couple thousand dollars or whatever. Like as it was starting out, and you'd be like, "Well, I'm gonna invest an X amount of money into you. I want a certain percent of your company because I'm helping you out at the start." But what people are are not understanding is that they're giving a person X amount of money for pretty much nothing for a product that doesn't exist yet, or for a product that exists. But is in not in the final state, and in no way is there promise is there a promise to be in the final state? You know what I mean? Like it's just, it's a strange just like these like the the people that are taking advantage of it. There are, there, there are some great people out there that use Kickstarter and use early access software for the benefit of society and for the benefit of everyone else. But there's other people, the greedy and like the the the, I mean the business type oriented people that are rubbing their hands together and being like people are willing to like invest in quotes in our company and feel like they're part of it without giving up anything let's use it like let's do it why not people love this stuff there yeah there there's a there's a fair amount of there's a fair amount of stories of people that have taken off with money from you know gofundmes or indiegogo and uh, like i mean I, I've, I've never checked the validity of those stories but like i mean there there's so many of them that like like what you're saying like the suits in some way whoever they are or just the business oriented can really just say, Hey, people are going to give us money for this. So we might as well, 
we might as well do it. You know, I'm sure there's a fair bit of corrupt charities in the world and stuff too, because it's just like, let's just get this money, right? There's schemes out there, there's scams and everything else, and this, you know, this could be exploited to be one of them. Well, it is. It is. Like, it's not could. It, it's most definitely exploited at this current stage. Well, it, it's exploited by some is what I'm yeah, trying to say. Like, not everyone. Like, some people do use this legitimately to get the funding they need, which is what it's supposed to be used for, right? Yes. And they're uh, great. Like, and it, it helps. Like I said in my notes, is like those, like, you know, unicorn developers that are really good, but they don't have the current funding or the current, like, you know, they don't have that the resources at hand and they can't get those investments for, for a product like this. It's great to be able to ask the community to be like, listen, if you really want this product, help me out right now. Um, but again, like it's, it's strange that we're doing it with like before we were doing it with investments, which made sense. Like someone's giving money for a percent of the company, they're benefiting from that, right? Like they're, they're taking a risk and they're understanding that risk, right? Like they're going right. to give you like that 10, 15, a hundred thousand dollars. And they know that potentially you could not make anything. You could lose that hundred thousand dollars into nothing. Uh, but but then if they do make something, at least they're getting like they're not getting their hundred thousand dollars back. They're getting two hundred thousand dollars or three hundred thousand dollars. You know what I mean? Like they're not they're not just getting a, a product. They're not just getting like a, a a simple phone or something that, that you could go in the store and buy. Like or like that you could wait for a couple months and just buy it. The, it. the benefits are like what monetary, right? You get a couple hundred dollars off sometimes. You get fifty dollars off, but I well, it's it, it's investment. It's investment. Maybe not in terms of like a legal term, but it's it's essentially investment on mass. I think yeah. is it? I forget. There was one crowdsource website with, in which it was an actual investment of sorts. Like that's how it was legally classified. I don't remember what it was. I remember reading a story about it at some point. But like it's essentially like like investment on mass. It's like you can have you can have these guys you can't have these guys with like how do I describe this? It's like it's like what you said like fifteen thousand dollars, ten thousand, seven thousand dollars. You can't have, you know, not everyone's going to be able to do that. But if if you're promising, hey, I have this new game console idea and this new game console is going to be great. Or I have this new software for designers and it's going to be great. Or like whatever it is. And somebody says, hey, I want that. And then they say, hey, I'm going to sell it for $499. But you can have it for $329 if you buy it now. But there's a risk that you'll never get it. It's essentially just investing on mass at that point. And you're not getting a stake you're purchasing a product that doesn't exist that may not exist or that may not exist in its same form. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's, it's a little bit messed up in that yeah. regard. It is like, ima- like, like imagine the pebble too. like pebble. First one comes out. Pebble was born, right? The smartwatch company pebble two basically got kiboshed. You know, some people were in the mail and they still got it. But then the services started being pulled offline, you know, short there at, shortly thereafter, and so and so they're not getting a product that they that that would be supported as long as they would expect it to. I would assume, you know, there's a whole bunch of intricacies in that deal with Fitbit that I don't know of, but that still sucks for the people. Well, myself included, I wasn't a, an investor in that way, but I was re- I was ready to purchase a Pebble Two, Pebble Two Steel or whatever they called it, and then. You know, it, and then they like the whole company gets shut down. But like, it's that it's and that was like an established company that was like one of the most successful Kickstarter kickstart companies. Right. And it like look how quickly it turned. And so like even even with a company that established, really, your money isn't necessarily safe. And that's such a risk when you're talking about going with it didn't online as tech tips. They review like a keyboard that was like kickstarted and it was supposed to be like a typewriter. And ended up being like super cheap or something. I don't, it was on his channel, but it was it's it's like I don't think the people were expecting that. I don't think they were expecting that cheapness, like that that cheap quality. Yeah, they got it got delivered. But how many how many dozens of projects do not get delivered at all or ever? Or you just get delayed for two years. Like you're you're gonna buy a product now. Like let's buy a backpack with a battery inside it, just as a theoretical. And you're gonna wait two three years until your pro- your product's delivered to your door. And then by that time, you, you don't even know if you need it. Like it's it's tough to me to picture myself buying something and then waiting, you know, six months for something. That I've done that before when I have to buy something like you know imported from China. Maybe like it's something that I don't need crucially right now. It usually costs somewhere between three and twenty dollars 
like really a, a side thing that I might need sometime in the future that I just buy. And sometimes it takes me like three months to get it because of customs and all that stuff. But like if I needed something like, for instance, a cell phone, there, there have been Kickstarter cell phones. Um, how could I possibly justify to myself spending $500 now to get a cell phone six months from now when I know that the industry could even change or they could deliver it two years from now, three years from now, like most of the time. If they do deliver, it's usually delayed. Like I don't know, I don't know how many percentage of projects are delivered on time, but I'm sure it's not in the, it's not over fifty. It's it's probably not probably not in the high range for sure, yeah. and it and it cert and it certainly isn't certainly isn't always of the quality that was promised or was expected. Yeah. So Th this is a this is a really this is a really weird era. I don't know. There's something weird yeah. going on. Like it's it's. Because I never really thought of it like this. It's like, look how look how volatile big businesses could be in something like a recession, let's say. And it's like, it's almost like that volatility is there every single day for startups, which it always has been. But now there's like a, a fun, like there's like a, a I want to say like a, a con, a, a, not a content funnel, but like a, a fund funnel. Where it's like you could release a very, very, very basic software version with a bunch of like things that you you know may or may not add to it and then get a bunch of people to buy it you can make a million dollars fortnite's making more than a million dollars way more than a million dollars like way more mm -hmm. and and you know they're coming out with toys like a you know official action figures or whatever and they got i'm sure they have memorabilia plans and they have the esports and then we got you know it it's it's, it's super it's super bizarre it's a weird they have deals with disney for christ's sake like they like if they have an unreleased game has deals with like one of the largest companies, media companies in the world. Unless this is, this, this is the era of labels don't matter yeah. when it comes to software, right? It's, it's labels like you, like you don't, you know, my, my product is my product. This is my product and I'm calling it a beta. And that's maybe like what you said before, maybe it's a shield that I hide behind it at times of need. But yeah. in general, I do not, I do not like need it. And I'm not going to bring that up. I don't go, hey, everybody, this is the Fortnite beta. You know, we say, hey, everybody, this is Fortnite. Like, I'm talking about, like, the eSport announcers, right? They don't yeah. announce the game as Fortnite beta, right? They say this is Fortnite Battle Royale, right? So that's super interesting in that, in that, like, and, and our buddies that play Seven Days to Die still. Like, that game was released on PlayStation 4 by Telltale. Telltale is dead. <laughs> So Telltale you're not gonna, is you're dead. You're not going to get get any updates for it. Well, I mean, it might. I think they're working with somebody else now or something because it was only published by Telltale. Like it wasn't developed by Telltale, oh, right? Okay, yeah. Fair so, enough. like, I think they can they can switch, you know, relatively easily. I don't know how exactly how that works legally or whatever, um, and whether there's remnants of Telltale left. I don't. I'm not sure, but it's it's like it's like look how long that game has been. Like like that game's been fucking around. Like, what are you guys doing? Just, like it's weird. It, it, I think we're in a weird state. Like we're just with, with this development stuff. Like I think it's just. I think it's a lot of people just being self conscious, and it's like we don't want to release. We don't want to say it's released because what if someone finds a bug? But really, like it is released, and people are finding bugs, and everything is just going the regular way of software as it always has been. Where like people will release 1.0 and people will find bugs and people will fix bugs and stuff like that. But they're just worried that if like, like you said, and we both said it now, uh, it's just self-conscious people and self-conscious companies that they want to have protect themselves against the industry and media and people and everything. I, I don't really particularly like that aspect of it, but I, I think we're going to have to live with it. I don't think there's anything that's, I don't think it's going to change anytime soon. I don't think anyone's going to come out and have like a gavel and be like, no, listen, no more early access. Like, that's it. I think it's going to continue being a big trend. And uh, hopefully people will be honest and not take advantage of people. But I don't think that's going to be the case every time. And it's just going to keep happening. So. Well, I mean, and it also does result in some pretty good things. You know, Pebble's yes. gone now, but they kind of kicked off the smartwatch uh, trend. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that whole thing. We have we have games that have come out. Minecraft is a, is a prime example. Minecraft is huge. Right, and that released on early access. That was on a beta, and then it eventually came out as full game. And then you know it went through a path, and it got bought by Microsoft, etc. But it got released into full production before Microsoft ever purchased it. 
you know, I think it was years before Microsoft there purchased it. It's, 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 it's like there, you know, we have good and very large products with tons and tons of customers that, and, and markets that come from these things. So it's a way to like stretch our creative minds, I guess, mm -hmm. but I think it's too easily exploitable. And I'm not, I'm not one personally to, to want there to be a lot of regulation in here because if you add regulation to something like this, like in term talking government regulation, you're talking about probably wait times of a year just to put up a posting. You're talking about teams that are going to disband before they can ever get their application in because it's going to take too long because government is generally slow. Mm -hmm. And what if they get denied after all that? It's like, well, they're not going to be able to raise funds because now they've committed to this early access model. So it's like, I want this to be like policed by the people by the platforms that are there, you know, I'm sure some laws apply to it, whatever, but I, it's may, I, maybe I, I, I'm wondering whether we're the, we're the odd ones out. Cause I don't hear this too often. You don't hear the negative, like people complaining about the fact that there's too much early access too often. Well, the physical products, the physical products, I hear it a lot The physical products. I hear a lot of people that are like, Oh, that's super cool. Let me know when it's out. I hear that a lot. Yeah. Um, and I think that's just like normal, like kind of hysteria of like, I don't want to buy that with, you know, because it's not out and that, you know, fair enough. But like with software, like software is kind of like the digital realms kind of weird. Like people still are like kind of physical, like they want physical things and they seem to, to treat digital stuff with lesser value a lot of the time. And, yeah. but so because of that, for whatever reason, it's like when they get a beta piece of software, I think that they throw that out the window. Um, they don't really think about it as, as a beta. And so I'm wondering whether like the labels are kind of breaking down in that regard and we're the weird ones in terms of software. Although there are a lot of people that are pissed off that whatever game they were playing, the developer took off or made another early access game, which has happened several times, um, where they just create like two or three games and then they don't have the bandwidth to support it, but they got a bunch of money. Um, and I don't know about any sort of limitation on that, uh, to be honest. Like, I mean, Steam has its own set of rules and that type of thing but it's it's a it's an interesting and very very strange time i think yeah it it's probably the internet maturing and we don't really know what to do with it all because we see we see stuff like this in youtube and everything where there's like scandals and stuff where it's like when was the last time you heard of an internet scandal like five years ago no like or maybe maybe five years ago but like 10 years ago there was no such thing as an internet scandal it was like people were learning how to use a webcam Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But like, like, look how quickly it's matured. And now we have like scandals and stuff, crazy stuff happening online. And we have like these social medias that are growing out of control and people are his, like, they, they're scared of it. They're not scared of them. We have early access software that isn't, you know, committing in, in our, in our opinion, it isn't committing to that relaunch to that launch. So it's a really, it's a weird, it's a weird time. Yeah. I, I agree. I don't. I don't think there's much else to say really because I we can't. There's no definitive way of saying like, oh, it's bad or good. But I think you just gotta live it and hope for the best. I don't know. Well, one other point, I real brief is I think I tweeted about this on the uh, the hat Twitter was that I said I think it was on Motivation Monday or something where is I just I'm paraphrasing uh, from memory here, but it was something along the lines of like as an entrepreneur, one of the hardest things to do is just to release something. And so what you really should do is just sort of release it. And I hear this a lot where people will like record a podcast and not want to not want to release it because the quality or something, or they'll make a product and they'll think it's dumb. So they won't release it when the, you know, you never really know. And I'm wondering whether like all, cause there's, there's, there's dozens and dozens of like entrepreneur self-help, Hey, build your, you know, build a business and you know, all kinds of self-help guys and educational guys on how to build business. And we talk about small business too, right? I'm not talking those guys down, but there's so many of those, those type of people that I'm wondering whether there's a mentality in entrepreneurs in general now where it's like, okay, I just need to release something. And there's like the, the early access guys or those guys where, where they're being convinced, okay, just release it. And that there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. But I'm just wondering whether that is playing a major role in the influx of beta, alpha, and early access software and hardware for that for that matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, it, that possibly could be, could be a case. And like... I, I still think that when you release something, you should just label it as released. I, I don't know. I, I just, I don't see the point. I, I understand why early access is a thing. 
Um, and I understand why people support it, but I don't like. I I still think release should be release, and there should be pressure associated with it, and there should be consequences of your actions based on the community. Like I I I agree with you that there shouldn't be regulation government wise, but the community should have like should be able to provide consequences for people that re- that release a product that isn't worthy of a release. And it, it has happened before and it will probably keep happening. It's just unfortunate that there's so much stuff like it's impossible to monitor everything, right? So I think it's just a, a product of our digital age right now that we have to kind of work through. I yeah, I think I think that's a good that's a good like closing note is it's it, we're in a we're in a transition of, of sorts and we don't know what's going on. So in five years this would this will be like probably concluded to an extent either it got regulated or it got changed or something happened and you know the result is like the result is there you know what i mean we then we'll know but i think right now we're in the middle of that mm-hmm. uh unless you have anything more to say i think we can probably conclude the show no, yeah. um Good to you go. want to uh yeah so uh thanks for listening and make sure you don't miss an episode by subscribing on the platform of your choice you can also follow us via the uh, socials, so that's at HTML, all the things on Facebook and Instagram. You can also find us on Twitter via at HTML everything. You can find us on Medium, you can find us on GitHub, and a bunch of other platforms, and I will be linking those in the show notes. Um, we also have a Patreon, so remember we're on Patreon via patreon.com slash HTML, all the things. Uh, take a look at the tiers, and maybe you want to shout out, uh, maybe you want to like kind of We'll semi-advertise your website on the uh, on, on the show. Go ahead. There's a tier there explaining what's going on. Feel free to uh, leave a comment or review on the platform you we are listening or you we're not listening to it. You're listening to this on, and we are signing off. 